We are now at module four in our series, and in this module, the question we hope to answer is, why are constitutions important to effective federal governance? A constitution is the basic law of a country, the rules that all governments must respect. Constitutions in federal countries are very important because they spell out the roles of the different orders of government. They provide the legal foundation for the federal system. At the same time, in most democracies, whether federal or non-federal, constitutions also help to protect the rights of citizens. While in this series of videos we have been describing federalism as a system of multiple levels of government, the citizens are also a very important part of the system. One of the main reasons for federalism is to provide more effective governance that is responsive to citizens. As you absorb the material of what follows, try to think how you, as a citizen, might fit into a democratic federal structure. A federal country is usually founded on a set of basic laws or a constitution. Constitutions in federal countries outline the roles and responsibilities of the central or federal government and of the constituent unit governments. Constitutions can do this in many different ways. They sometimes have exhaustive lists of powers for each order of government. At other times, there is a list of powers for one order of government and the other gets everything not named. Constitutions vary greatly. Some are quite short, listing basic principles, while some are very detailed. Many constitutions also deal with the question of rights. In countries such as Canada, there are provisions for the rights of different language groups. In others, there are extensive economic and social rights. Democratic and federal countries deal with the rights of citizens in a variety of ways. Within the constitutions, there can be a charter of rights, you know, sections of the constitution which just uh, enumerates particular rights. Uh, some of it can be common law, uh, where the courts have a view, for example, habeas corpus is a long, there's a long tradition in, in uh, common law of the right of relation to habeas corpus where you can't be, be held without, uh, without there being a charge and, and, and due cause. So uh, the, there you, you get mixtures of these types of things. You can also have legislation as opposed to constitutional, legislative as opposed to constitutional rights where a particular law will establish certain types of rights. And what is a right? A right is something, I mean a legal right is something where you can take it to the courts and say, you know, this is, uh, I have a right to this. So it could be a property right. And uh, it could be, but it's something that's testable in the courts. Uh, now, what you'll see in a number of constitutions is rights that are expressed as social and economic rights, but they're probably not testable in the courts. So they say that everybody has the right to a fair, to a living wage. Well, uh, in a poor country, maybe that's just not a practical matter. So it's. Those types of rights which find themselves expressed in the Constitution are often more an expression of the ambition of the country and the direction that the country would like to go as opposed to defining a legal right. Together with a Constitution that defines roles and rights, federal countries almost always have a constitutional arbiter or a referee. Its job is to interpret the Constitution and settle conflicts and disagreements between orders of government. In most federations, that referee role is played by the courts. A strong, independent system of courts and judges is necessary for the rule of law, especially in federal countries. 
Most federations give the power to resolve constitutional disputes to the courts, and those courts will sometimes reject the laws or actions of powerful elected governments. A few federations do not give all aspects of final constitutional arbitration to judges. Switzerland can use a referendum to reach a decision when there is a conflict over a federal or a cantonal law. In Ethiopia, it is an elected body, the upper house, called the House of the Federation, that has the final authority on constitutional conflicts. Still, independent courts and judges are very important in federal countries, and their decisions can have long-term and significant impact. In the United States and Canada, the Supreme Courts have ruled that laws banning abortion were unconstitutional, decisions which have had a great impact on many people. Another important United States Supreme Court decision was the famous Brown versus the Kansas City Board of Education ruling in 1954. That decision banned the practice of forcing black American children into segregated schools. Those schools were called separate but equal. In fact, they were both separate and unequal. The 1954 decision of the Supreme Court, led by Chief Justice Earl Warren, led to massive and profound changes in United States society over the past five and a half decades. The Canadian Supreme Court ruled in 1998 that the province of Quebec did not have the right to unilaterally secede from Canada. However, it added that the rest of Canada would have a political obligation to negotiate Quebec's separation if a clear majority of that province's population voted in favour of it. That ruling has been extremely important to the practice of federalism in Canada. It underscores the key role of courts in democratic federal countries. Because constitutions are so basic to the way federal countries work, it's not easy to change or amend them. Amending the Constitution in a country with different orders of government, I mean, it, or even in a unitary regime, a Constitution is the law that sits above all laws, if I can put it that way. It's the basic framework law. It expresses longer term, uh, it embodies the longer term structures of the country, longer term objectives, and so on. So, it, and it overrides any individual legislative law if there's a conflict between the two. So it's, a, it's, a, it's the central law of the country. It's important. But in, in terms of how you change it, in a federal country, most federations say that given that we have a, a, a dual order of government, um, most amendments to the Constitution will require a special amending procedure. And it, often that will involve both orders of government, particularly if the relative authorities of the two orders of government are involved. So the states, if something affects the, uh, the authority or the powers of the states or the provinces, uh, the central government in most federations could not change the constitution without some, some type of agreement, at least from probably a majority or maybe even a, a supermajority of the states or provinces. Not always the case. I mean, this is the lovely thing about federalism. Uh, there are always exceptions. So India is an exception. I mean, India, it's all done through the central legislature, but where they have special majority requirements. Uh, but, but the issue is changing constitutions is almost always more difficult than passing a simple law because it requires a special majority. And in federal regimes, some changing some parts of the constitution will probably involve agreement by the central government and by at least a majority of the states or provinces, and perhaps will involve through referendum uh, the population as well. To amend the Brazilian constitution requires approval of 60% of the members of both houses of parliament. The small states have strong representation in Brazil's upper house, the Senate. South Africa requires a supermajority of more than 50% plus one in the federal lower house, plus the consent of six of the nine provinces for amendments affecting provinces. Russia requires supermajorities in both federal houses of parliament, plus, for the most part, 
supermajority approval of two-thirds of the constituent unit governments. Canada has five different rules for amending its constitution. Certain types of amendments require unanimous consent of the federal government and all the provinces. Others require the federal government and seven provinces with at least half the population. Others require only the federal government and a single province. India also has different rules for different types of amendments. Our module question has been, why are constitutions important to effective federal governance? To help answer the question, think about each of the following constitutional elements and ask yourself how important they are to the effective governance of your country. Use the scale of one, unimportant, two, moderately important, and three, very important, to grade the importance of each element which follows. One, basic rights of citizens. Two, rights of minorities. Three, different rights for different parts of a country. Four, a neutral court system. Five, the interests of constituent units and citizens when the Constitution could be amended or changed. If you answered two, moderately important, or three, very important, to any of these questions, you have the answer to our module question. To summarize, the basis for effective federal governance is a constitution. And while constitutions may vary from country to country, a federal country functions best with a constitution that ensures the rule of law, the rights of its citizens, and the independence of its courts, and defines the roles of the orders of government. Thank you.